So another issue that, that can arise in your case is that sometimes uh, it can be very difficult to settle our uh, separate property claims. Um, you know, just some, some basic, you know, tenets of the law with respect to that is, is that assuming that you can prove that the property that you have uh, of your client, if your client is telling you that they've got separate property, property owned part of their marriage, um, then you still have to overcome the, the, the problem that the court has all property before both separate and community to be able to divide if they think it's fair and equitable to do so. And so they can invade another party's separate property to be able to make a fair and equitable distribution. So, um, but, but that being said, it's still your job as an attorney to be sure that if you have a client who is telling you that they've got, you know, separate property, they own property prior to marriage, whether that's, you know, real estate or bank accounts or, you know, funds that they had received, um, you've got to be able to be sure that you can, you know, uh, show the court that, as to the proper characterization of that actual property. Um, so some, some basic, you know, uh, community property tenants, uh, of course, we know that all property that's acquired during the marriage is presumed to be community property, and that's whether it's, you know, uh, community property or not. If you can't prove that it, that it isn't, then it's going to be characterized as community property. That's, what, that's how strong that presumption is. And then, of course, on the other hand, um, property that you own before the marriage is characterized as separate property, and that includes all the rents and issues, profits that are coming from that separate property, uh, and that flow from that separate property as well, and they remain separate property. And then property that's inherited or, or gifted to your to your client during the marriage itself, that's also characterized as separate property. And and so under that circumstance, it's like if you get your client has a, a check from his you know mom or something like that, uh, it says you know. Here's a hundred thousand dollar check to my son, you know, only and not to the marital community. That would be something then you could prove that the donor's intent clearly was that that would be separate property and remain separate property. Um, but sometimes it can be more difficult than that, of course, and that there could be other issues that are going to come up. And this is really tracing. Um, I, I personally um, uh, find these cases to be extremely enjoyable because of the fact that there's a very specific task in front of you that you've got to be able to accomplish uh, to be able to prove that the, uh, that the property is, is separate property through, through tracing and a tracing analysis. Um, and, and the standard that the law is going to, that the court's going to apply to the situation is a clear and convincing evidence test. And so you've got to have evidence, and that, that evidence is usually going to be in some form of documentary, you know, uh, evidence, uh, whether it's bank statements, whether it's real estate documents, you know, whatever it is um, that, that you have to be able to, uh, to obtain to be able to trace that property back is something that you've got to submit to the court to be able to defeat the community property presumption. Um, the first thing that I think is extremely important under these situations in this scenario is explain the tracing requirement to your client. What I do is, you know, kind of, you know, describe it as a dot to dot, you know, kind of puzzle in terms of that is that you've got to make sure that all the dots connect to be able to, uh, to trace it back to that, to that separate property source. And so um, it's really important for your client to have an understanding as to what that requirement is because they're the ones who usually are going to be, you know, uh, obtaining those documents in some way. Um, I've had everything from, you know, uh, upon the first meeting with a client that they came in with three banker boxes full of documents and um, had, you know, 15 years of bank statements with them at that point in time because they obviously had done some research on this issue and knew exactly what that requirement was going to be. Um, but usually that's not the case. And, and depending upon the length of the marriage, you know, um, these documents can go back 10, 15 years um, that you're going to need to try to obtain them from a financial institution, assuming that they exist at all. I think most financial institutions have, you know, a seven-year purging uh, policy in place, and so, you know, they may not be able to be able to get these documents at all. But it's still your job as diligent attorney to be able to make sure that you've made a request or that you've done everything you can to be able to obtain these documents if they, if they do actually exist. So it's important to, you know, immediately make a request for these documents um, and, and get on that from the get-go. I mean, um, it can take months sometimes to be able to find out and obtain these documents back from financial institutions if they have them. Have your clients ask them, you know, to, to go back to their banks. Um, some banks have changed names, changed ownership. Um, make a request of those documents. You know, your clients sometimes, given the fact that they've got a relationship with the bank, uh, can, can make headway in terms of that. Well, I'm only, uh, work something out here and then walk out of the room. Um, barring that, they're just hard cases to settle. You can prepare all you want, but uh, the statute's usually pretty clear. And the, the unfortunate thing is that as hard as they are to settle, most lawyers that do much relocation work know what the what's going to happen with the case when it comes in the door. Um, there are just some people that don't want to uh, face that reality. Um, I wish I had more to say on trying to settle relocation cases, but they're just hard.
So another issue that, that can arise in your case is that sometimes uh, it can be very difficult to settle are uh, separate property claims. Um, you know, just some, some basic, you know, tenets of the law with respect to that is, is that assuming that you can prove that the property that you have uh, of your client, if your client is telling you that they've got separate property, property owned part of the marriage, um, then you still have to overcome the, the, the problem that the court has all property before both separate and community to be able to divide if they think it's fair and equitable to do so. And so they can invade another party's separate property to be able to make a fair and equitable distribution. So, um, but, but that being said, it's still your job as an attorney to be sure that if you have a client who is telling you that they've got, you know, separate property, they own property prior to marriage, whether that's, you know, real estate or bank accounts or, you know, funds that they had received, um, you've got to be able to be sure that you can, you know, uh, show the court that, as to the proper characterization of that actual property. Um, so some, some basic, you know, uh, community property tenants, uh, of course, we know that all property that's acquired during the marriage is presumed to be community property, and that's whether it's, you know, uh, community property or not. If you can't prove that it, that it isn't, then it's going to be characterized as community property. That's, what, that's how strong that presumption is. And then, of course, on the other hand, um, property that you own before the marriage is characterized as separate property, and that includes all the rents and issues, profits that are coming from that separate property, uh, and that flow from that separate property as well, and they remain separate property. And then property that's inherited or, or gifted to your to your client during the marriage itself, that's also characterized as separate property. And and so under that circumstance, it's like if you get your client has a, a check from his you know mom or something like that, it uh, says you know. Here's a hundred thousand dollar check to my son, you know, only and not to the marital community. That would be something then you could prove that the donor's intent clearly was that that would be separate property and remain separate property. Um, but sometimes it can be more difficult than that, of course, and that there could be other issues that are going to come up. And this is really tracing. Um, I, I personally um, uh, find these cases to be extremely enjoyable because of the fact that there's a very specific task in front of you that you've got to be able to accomplish uh, to be able to prove that the, uh, that the property is, is separate property through, through tracing and a tracing analysis. Um, and, and the standard that the law is going to, that the court's going to apply to the situation is a clear and convincing evidence test. And so you've got to have evidence, and that, that evidence is usually going to be in some form of documentary, you know, uh, evidence, uh, whether it's bank statements, whether it's real estate documents, you know, whatever it is um, that, that you have to be able to, uh, to obtain to be able to trace that property back is something that you've got to submit to the court to be able to defeat the community property presumption. Um, the first thing that I think is extremely important under these situations in this scenario is explain the tracing requirement to your client. What I do is, you know, kind of, you know, describe it as a dot to dot, you know, kind of puzzle in terms of that is, is that you've got to make sure that all the dots connect to be able to, uh, to trace it back to that, to that separate property source. And so um, it's really important for your client to have an understanding as to what that requirement is because they are the ones who usually are going to be, you know, uh, obtaining those documents in some way. Um, I've had everything from, you know, uh, upon the first meeting with a client that they came in with three banker boxes full of documents and um, had, you know, 15 years of bank statements with them at that point in time because they obviously had done some research on this issue and knew exactly what that requirement was going to be. Um, but usually that's not the case. And, and depending upon the length of the marriage, you know, um, these documents can go back 10, 15 years um, that you're going to need to try to obtain them from a financial institution, assuming that they exist at all. I think most financial institutions have, you know, a seven-year purging uh, policy in place, and so, you know, they may not be able to be able to get these documents at all. But it's still your job as diligent attorney to be able to make sure that you've made a request or that you've done everything you can to be able to obtain these documents if they, if they do actually exist. So it's important to, you know, immediately make a request for these documents um, and, and get on that from the get-go. I mean, um, it can take months sometimes to be able to find out and obtain these documents back from financial institutions if they have them. Have your clients ask them, you know, to, to go back to their banks. Um, some banks have changed names, changed ownership. Um, make a request of those documents. You know, your clients sometimes, given the fact that they've got a relationship with the bank, uh, can, can make headway in terms of that. If you need to, use compulsory process to be able to subpoena the, the documents directly from the bank to be able to obtain them so that you've got them to be able to, uh, to perform this you know, tracing um, analysis. Um, and then once you've got the evidence that you need, um, if it's feasible, if you have, you know, your client has the means to be able to hire an expert to be able to assist you in the tracing analysis, I think it's, it's wise to do so. Um, I think your client can, of course, perform the tracing analysis themselves, and, and they can certainly put a report together and, and show all the documents that would be necessary to be able to either provide to a mediator or to the trial judge.
Um, but I think it's always more powerful if you've got an expert witness that you can call in to be able to, you know, uh, perform the tracing analysis, get, you know, get an accountant or somebody who uh, does this to be able to give a report. You can provide that report to your mediator. And if you can't settle your case, then you can provide that report to the trial judge to be able to, um, you know, show and, and, and trace the property back to, to the separate property source. Um, some common tracing scenarios that, that, that I've run into in my practice, and I'm sure that probably you have as well, um, include a scenario where, for example, um, let's say a spouse owns a piece of uh, a house prior to the marriage, and maybe the, the, the parties even live uh, together prior to the marriage in that house, and then they get married, and then um, during the marriage they sell that house, and that house then, the proceeds from that are then deposited onto a new residence, um, that new residence um, then is titled in both parties' names, um, or, and maybe even some of the funds that came from the sale of that separate property residence went into the new residence to be able to, you know, improve it. Maybe they did a, a kitchen remodel or something like that, uh, and then um, that house then even can be sold, and then and then another house is purchased. And, and so you've got to go back and, and take a look at what documents are going to exist to be able to show that. There are going to be checks that were probably written, you know, from escrow. Uh, there may have been earnest money checks that are deposited down on that from the sale of the first home. There are going to be HUD statements. Um, you know, the, the, the documents that you're going to receive from escrow, escrow, your client may have those to be able to, you know, prove this tracing analysis. Um, and it's important to be able to get that information, get those documents, so that you can then prove to the trial court or prove to your mediator that this um, uh, property has been traced back to a separate property source. It's clearly met that clear and convincing evidence test, and so it should be characterized as, um, as a, a separate property. Uh, another you know, uh, common scenario that we run into is, is a bank account. And if, if somebody owned a bank account prior to marriage that had a certain deposit of funds in it, Later, that uh, account is used to be able to um, purchase other things after the marriage, and um, so funds are taken from a separate property account, deposited into a community property account, and then let's say that they buy snowmobiles or they buy something else, you know, a, as an asset. If you can trace that back to that separate property source, then you can you can uh, advise the court that that's separate property, uh, and that gives you the ability to then argue to the court why it shouldn't be invaded. Um, once again, the court has to have in mind. Um, the characterization of the property when making a fair and equitable distribution. And I think that, you know, although there's a line of cases that talks about, you know, it doesn't have to be extraordinary for the court to be able to invade separate property to be able to, uh, to make a fair and equitable distribution, certainly um, having in mind that the, the property is separate property may be something that be, would be in favor of your client, uh, assuming that you're representing the client who has that separate property. And then, of course, um, there are, there's a scenario where you've got a retirement account that was both uh, pre-marriage and then post-marriage. Let's say you've got an, a, a Boeing employee who worked at Boeing and, and, and uh, deposited funds into their VIP for five years prior to the marriage, and then the, and they get married and then um, continue to uh, contribute towards that VIP account for 10 years after the marriage. So it's going to have a mixed uh, character you know, uh, property and uh, both separate and, and community, um, you know, have a, a, an accountant uh, assess exactly what it is that is separate, what it is that's community, so that you can then advise the court specifically uh, what, what the characterization of that account would be. And then there are, of course, stock awards and our options. We don't see as many option cases uh, these days, but certainly stock awards um, are something that we do see, and the vesting schedules of those, uh, you know, uh, can also affect the characterization. It's wise to be able to have a, uh, an accountant uh, make a determination as to exactly what that characterization is so that when you go before your mediator or you go before your trial judge that you can argue these things uh, in, front of the, uh, in front of the mediator or trial judge. I wanted to comment on um, one of the cases that recently came out in, in 2009, uh, Estate of Borgie. Um, and the reason why is because it really kind of changed the law with respect to how it is that we treat property that was titled in both parties' names. Um, and and uh, uh, this is uh, a game of King's X because that was specifically what it is that the court had stated in, in, in the case. Um, we, of course, knew that pre-marriage of Borgi, the, the cases of Olivares and Heard, um, standed for the proposition that if a person used their separate property to be able to purchase a residence, and then they titled that residence in both parties' names, that there was this um, joint title gift presumption that now that property was, was community property. And I thought that the, the reasoning and the analysis in this case was... Um, was, was very poignant because of the fact that, you know, it talked about 
um, these presumptions having a control over how this property was going to be characterized instead of the actual intent of the person who owned the separate property. And so um, the, the case of uh, Estate of Borgi essentially overruled both Olivares and Heard and said, you know, it can't just be a game of King's X with respect to how it is that the property is going to be characterized. If, um, you know, the separate property presumption is one of the presumptions in place, um, and um, then, of course, if the spouse titles the property in both parties' names, then there's another presumption in place that now it's community. Well, then you're at a standstill. How do you resolve that particular issue? Um, and then, of course, um, the, the court came down and said, um, we're, we're, we're going to overrule this joint gift title presumption, and um, that separate property presumption you know, is going to still be in place with respect to that. That doesn't mean that you give up at that point in time just because of the fact that the Borgi said that um, they weren't going to um, continue to honor the joint title gift presumption. I think it just means that you have to have additional evidence um, it, other than just the title itself um, to be able to show, was this intended to be a gift? And, you know, you can do that by, you know, depose the other party in the case and find out why did they put that house into both parties' names under the circumstances of the case. Um, you know, many times you'll have the other side say, well, you know, we were in love and I wanted, you know, my, my other spouse to be able to have, you know, something that they could call their own. Um, that type of evidence and information, you know, if, if, it, if you get it in front of your trial judge, can have a dramatic impact on whether or not was that intended to be a gift, you know, to the marital community at that point in time. So they've got to come up with some kind of an answer in terms of why it is that it was, that it was titled in, in both parties' uh, names. I'm just going to briefly talk about, you know, expectancy and, and loss because um, these are issues that, you know, um, we should be arguing in, in the cases that we have here. Um, inheritance, you know, um, is something that can, that can be argued. And really the issue there is whether or not it's a vested interest or is it just a mere expectancy. And so um, if your client is named uh, as a party to, you know, their parents' will or something like that and their parents are still living, the courts have characterized that just as a mere expectancy. Um, the will could be changed. There are things that could take place that are going to uh, impact whether or not th those funds would actually be received or not received. Um, however, if you know, if grandma does die and you know your client is named as the uh, um, beneficiary of, of the will, well, that's now a vested interest that they have in that, and then the court is going to consider that. It's of course still characterized as as the um, person's separate property because of the fact that it's inherited, but the court is going to take into consideration all property that's owned when they're going to be making a fair and equitable division. And so that's something that certainly you can argue. Um, parental gifts or other gifts um, kind of falls under the same uh, expectancy um, you know, prong um, in terms of not necessarily being considered by the court. Um, there's no requirement that a gift is going to be made into the future. Um, remarriage can be something else that could be argued. There was an old case that cited in the material, and the judge in that case uh, specifically said, you know, it was unlikely that the wife was going to remarry, and so that was one of the justifications that they made for making a determination as to whether or not that spouse should receive spousal maintenance. It's an old case, but it is something that uh, it, it hasn't been overruled. It's still, still there for you to be able to quote. And then Social Security payments, um, this really is kind of both, uh, you know, Social Security is, is characterized as the separate property of the person who is contributing towards the separate, uh, towards the Social Security, um, but still that's something that if the other spouse isn't going to benefit as a result of that because maybe they weren't married for, for uh, long enough for the spouse to be able to collect on the Social Security benefits, um, that would be something that you could argue with respect to what would be an overall fair division of property given that one of the spouses may be receiving Social Security benefits but the other would not be.